Hello and welcome to Class 5 of Restored Gospels Teaching Series, The Final Prophecy. In this class, we conclude what all the physical and spiritual discussion from the previous class suggests, that God himself, the creator of the universe, stepped out of eternity and entered into this world of time, space, and matter. The Book of Mormon shares a plain message regarding all this, that God entered this existence, physically taking on flesh, to provide the only means possible to satisfy the demands of justice. The infinite Creator's blood, in exchange for humanity's sin, was the only way possible where mercy could be applied and humanity able to return to His world, freed from this world of sin and matter and space and time. While the first portion of Class 5 reviewed some of the physical parallels of science to the spiritual world shared from the previous class, we begin a few minutes into Class 5, where important conclusions are made concerning the spiritual and the physical. Every description of the eternal God in the Bible is equated to the physical Jesus Christ in the Book of Mormon. It is this God of eternity who stepped through the gate of eternity into the space and time he created and became man as Jesus Christ, the sacrifice. One may ask why this topic is discussed in a class regarding prophecy and end times. This is important for all humanity to understand that the future pivotal point of all these prophecies begins to be fulfilled when Israel recognizes that it was the very God of Israel who died for them and us on the cross. When that day occurs, they will, according to the prophecy, look to him who they pierced, asking, what are these holes in your hands and feet? And they will weep to know the truth. This class also reminds us of an important reason we have the Book of Mormon, because God didn't want the Gentiles or anyone to stumble in our understanding of who he is and how to come to him. While theologians and Christians have sought understanding regarding the relation between God the Father and Jesus for centuries, the Book of Mormon's clear answer to us is that God was called the Son because he took on flesh. Abinadi died just so we could know that. This class makes it clear that even within the Restoration, people have questions regarding who God is and who Jesus is, so we use the plain explanations of the Book of Mormon to find these answers. God's name as the Father in the Bible are the same names for Jesus in the Book of Mormon. This class discusses some of those names, but for those interested in further study, a more complete list is available at the Restored Gospel website. Just go to Restored Gospel's top menu bar, look for the word study, and then click on that, and in that section you'll find a document called Who is Jesus? Open that document and you'll find a more complete list of many verses of the Bible and the Book of Mormon compared, showing God's name and Jesus being one. So thank you for joining us for another discussion as we join into class five of this final prophecy series. In the olden days of God's people, they had a temple and, and asked the question, well, why was the altar outside the temple? And there's symbolism on every level that God teaches. And this temple represented the holy place, the heaven, if you will. The altar represented a place where sin and death occurred, and it was outside of that heavenly place. And in this altar on, on many levels symbolized uh, the atonement, uh, Jesus' death. Animals were sacrificed and their blood was brought into the temple and this blood was sprinkled on a place in the Holy of Holies where only the high priest could go once a year, sprinkled on the mercy seat of uh, this gold. It was beaten gold uh, of the cover of the Ark of the Covenant and this blood of the bullock or the goat or whatever was sacrificed was sprinkled on that. Now, why did they do all that? Well, it symbolized everything Jesus would do. He became the sacrifice. His own blood was brought to the Holy of Holies in heaven. The, the work, we say, was finished on the cross, but the cross was the altar. The, the work wasn't finished until he returned back to heaven and, and, and said, I've overcome. And his blood was the sacrifice. The mercy seat at the seat of God was where his victory was presented and there's symbols in every part of Jesus' life that parallel this too. You know, remember the story, uh, just incidentally, when Jesus had died, his Bible story, and was placed in the tomb, and the first person to go find him was Mary, and Mary's like not even realizing it's him thinking it's the gardener, but then she realizes it's Jesus, and, and she wants to touch him, and what's he say? Don't touch me. 
right? And once you say, I haven't yet ascended to my father, right? Well, he was fulfilling the prophecy in, and the requirement because when the high priest took the blood from this altar, he was, this was the altar. The high priest had special vessels where the blood was captured. He and only he could take that blood. And once he had that blood, he could no more contact another human being. He was not allowed to touch anyone or talk to anyone. And he and only he could go into the temple. And Jesus was the only one. And from that time of his death, he was not in contact with anyone else until he ascended to his father. And then when he comes back as a resurrected Christ, he says, see and feel and touch. But on, on every level, even to the smallest detail, these things were executed to teach about the sacrifice of Christ. And there's many, many things about this that have profound implication. So these vessels, they captured the blood. and Everything was commanded by God in this temple to be done in a certain way. He, he told them how big to make it and what materials to use. And he even told them how to make these little vessels that would be used for many things. Some would hold coals, some would hold you know, burning coals, some would hold incense, but some would actually hold the blood. Well, if you know the story of Nephi, 600 years before Christ, Jerusalem's destroyed. And who's Jerusalem destroyed by? The Babylonians, right? They're the Gentiles. They're the, they're the heathen nation who kind of surrounded Israel. And they overrun Israel, and as part of their... Their prize, they ransacked the temple. You know, they, they destroyed Jerusalem. And whoever wasn't killed, whoever didn't escape out of Egypt, which was few, got taken hostage into Babylon. And that's where you have the story of Daniel living in captivity. But the Babylonians, knowing the temple was this prized place of, of the Hebrews, go into the temple and they desecrate it. You know, and they, they actually take these vessels that God had given. And they carry them, you know, this is, this is the booty, this is what we won, these are our prized possessions, and they carry them back into Babylon, the very, the very vessels that carried the blood of the sacrifice. So, some years later, Daniel's in this Babylonian kingdom, and he's risen to power because of his knowledge and understanding, which exceeds all those of the people of the nation. And the Babylonians are doing their Babylonian thing, and they're having a party. And their party is a little different than other parties because at one point, the Babylonian king makes a statement. He goes, hey, let's get our concubines drunk. That's basically what he said in, in so many words. And in fact, to celebrate, anyone remember where we put all those vessels from the temple that we ransacked in Jerusalem? Yeah, get those and let's serve our concubines wine out of these vessels. And so in the process of that, now you might not know that part of the story, but the reason I'm sharing this is because in the process of time, the story you probably do remember is all of a sudden a finger appears out of nowhere and starts writing on the wall. And it writes in some foreign languages, meany, meany, you saw, you, I don't know what it was. They didn't know what it was either. And they say, hey, get Daniel. See what he has to say about this. And they're scared. I mean, the king's knees are knocking together, it says, when he sees this happen. And now you got to remember, they're in the act of taking the very um, <coughs> symbols that God gave for one of the most holy, holy, holy events, and they're doing some of the most foul, corrupt, evil things they can. And, and maybe they don't even know. They're just dumb. They're just having a party. But it was that was the turning point, and... Daniel interprets the writing on the wall and says, Oh, king, this is a warning to you that your kingdom is going to be cut off. Tonight, you're going to be cut down at the knees. He said, it all changes now because God has had enough of what you're doing to his holy things. And it happens exactly as, as, as he says. The Persians come and they wipe out the Babylonians. The Persians are actually kind to the Hebrews. Uh, and, and then you get the story of Esther and how people come back and rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. But the reason I share this is because the things that God gave on a spiritual nature are important then and they're important now. In our society, our society has taken the holy things of God, things like marriage, for instance, and decided to turn it into anything it wants, to use the, the, the holy symbols that he created and then to desecrate it into anything we want. There's a point when God finally says enough. There's a point where God says, in the end of 3 Nephi 9, the last five or six verses, he says, I'm going to cut off 
the soothsayers, and I'm going to cut off the adulterers and the witchcraft, and I'm going to cut all this stuff out so that we can have a clean slate to start his kingdom from in this land, in the land of the Gentiles. And so his, and I'm digressing a little bit, but I'm on a roll, so I'm going to keep going. His point is that all these things were for a purpose, and if we understand the symbols that he gave us, we'll understand the spiritual significance and sometimes the incredible spiritual significance of what he did on our behalf so that we could have life for him, with him. In this time, one of the other stories, you can find it in Leviticus 16. I was going to read it, but for, for sake of time, I don't think I will. Part of this offering they did annually was to bring two goats. And they picked two goats without any real special um, criteria. And upon one goat, they, they would cast lots upon one goat. All the sin of the people, they would pray and they would announce all the sin, all their all their fornications or all their adulteries or all their murders or all their lines or all their whatever they did. And they would put all that sin on a goat. And you know what? That goat got to go free. That was called the scapegoat. Well, the, the, then there was the scapegoat, rather. The, the scapegoat was the other one. And that was presented live before the altar. And it was killed on behalf of all the people with all those sins. So what do those goats represent? The ones that got to go free are you and me, right? We had our sin, and we didn't... If, if the other goat was offered, that was Jesus Christ. He's the one who died on our behalf so that we could go free. His blood, that blood of that goat, was offered on the mercy seat as well as a bullet. So God creates these simple requirements that were to try to teach profound found spiritual messages, spiritual lessons to us. And the people often didn't get the point of the lesson. They got too caught up in the details of the story. And we hope that that's not our case. So just moving on, we shared a little bit of this last week. We talked quite a bit about uh, some physics. Now, I have to just ask you this question. You know, this universe we have, um, does anybody know what the universe is doing right now? It's expanding. This universe, I mean, our little tiny pale blue dot is one little sphere circling around one sun. There's billions of suns inside billions of galaxies. And did you know that they're they're not only spreading out, but... I was just going to say it's endless. It's end, it, Well, it's growing and it's accelerating. Now, that word accelerating is kind of strange because if you have a gun, and I, I'm not a good illustrator, but say this is the barrel of a gun and you've got this little bullet in here and somehow in here there's this little cartridge and... In this cartridge, there's gunpowder. When the gunpowder explodes, pew, there's a big explosion. And that expansion of gas creates pressure. That pressure is a force. Now, a force isn't just pressure. A force is a pressure in a direction, right? But it has to be increasing. Since this gas is increasing, this bullet that starts out at zero feet per second starts accelerating down here, and it's getting faster and faster. And right here, it might be like you know 200 feet per second. Here, it might be 800 feet per second. By the time it leaves, maybe it's traveling at a thousand feet per second, right? This bullet, bullets out here now, and and it's at a thousand feet per second. Now, a hundred feet away, if this went from, say, this is two feet long, and it's a thousand feet per second, and now like two feet farther out or a hundred feet farther out, how fast is that bullet going? And then you do the math, slower. <laughs> <laughs> say it's in a perfect vacuum. Say there's no air resistance or anything like that. How fast is it going out here? Until, until gravity takes over and the bullet does this. How fast is it going? A thousand feet per second. Because it only accelerates while there's a force on it. All right? Now that you're thinking, why is he doing this? <laughs> I'm done with high school, right? This <laughs> bullet only goes faster and faster until the expansion of the gas stops. That baseball is coming at the... At the, the uh, batter, and that bat hits that ball, it reverses its direction and its energy, and it accelerates very quickly as long as it's in contact with the bat. But after it's out of contact with the bat, does it keep going faster and faster and faster? No, it slows down. So out here it's a thousand feet per second. Out here it's a thousand feet per second until it finally hits the ground. Barring friction, Newtonian's laws. Object remains in motion. But the point is, it's not accelerating anymore. 
Now, why is this important to bring up? Because the universe is not only getting bigger, it's expanding. It's as if it's going 2,000 feet per second here and 4,000 feet per second. That the creation that God started, when he said, let there be light, didn't just say, poof, okay, it's there, and now it's just floating out at the same speed. It's saying, poof, and it's going faster and faster and faster. Now, that might already be mind-bending. I get it. And I'm actually going to puzzle you with a few things. If this picture represented the universe, and there's a reason I'm sharing this, so hang with me, because this isn't physics class, even though it might seem like it. Scientists claim everything in this universe started, you listen to people like Stephen Hawking, he said all the mass of the entire universe was compressed into the cell of one tiny atom. He said, don't know how it's possible. And you know what they also can't explain? What existed before that? Because they said time could not have existed. All right? Scientists already claim time could not exist before the universe came into being. They can't explain it, but they see the effect of it. And they said within 110 to the, this is what science would say, 10 to the minus 32, which is like 0 with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 all the way out to, to 1. That fraction of a second, 30-some zeros, that the Earth expanded to about the size of six light years. Now, that's faster than the speed of light and travel, but they said it instantly went from nothing to something huge, but it's been expanding ever since, but not expanding, accelerating. How does something accelerate unless there's a force on it? Once the force is off, it goes at constant velocity. Our universe is expanding because the Word of God is a force. And the Word of God is endless. The Word of God is unlimited in its power. And it's still exerting its force on every particle of creation since God transformed light into matter, space, and time. And it's still having the effect which means that every particle in this universe is still under the authority of God. Satan is the one who's got to worry, and he knows, because he knows that everything, in fact, the, the physics and the spiritual, we think science and, and spiritual things are like on opposite ends of the spectrum, and, and they're not. They're maybe on opposite sides of a circle. If you take one circle, one side far enough, you're going to reach the other side. If you take faith far enough, it'll bring you to science. If you take science far enough and ask the right questions... It'll bring you back to faith, what faith's been saying all along. And I'll show you a couple of those things. But again, that's not the point. There's a bigger point. This, this drawing cannot even represent the universe because the universe exists of matter, space, and time. And, and the time is a dimension that, this is only two dimensions. It, it can't even be um, shown here. But this point I want to make is simply that if it's expanding outward at a faster rate, it has to have a force on it, and it's the original force of God. Now, scientists will say, oh, well, then there's dark matter. There's this thing that exists that we can't see, but it must be creating the energy, and that's where... Whenever you hear terms like dark matter, you know they don't know what they're talking about. But they, they can't explain what existed prior. They agree that time couldn't exist, and they, they also don't know how it could be continually accelerating. Now, last week we did a profound equation, 6 equals 2 times 3, right? And most people even told me the answer before I finished the equation. But so this is also true, right? And what I'm talking about, remember, we talked about equations. An equation, this equal sign, means that whatever you have on the left side equals whatever you have on the right side. Or we said, backing up, six can be three groups of two, or two groups of three, or it could be one group of six. Or, or you could have three groups of four, but divide those four in two, and you'll get six. This, the numbers have a relationship to each other. And now, hang with me. What happens when you take this number in the numerator, remember that term, over the denominator? If the numerator gets bigger, what happens to the product in the end? It's going to get bigger, right? So show this just as an example. You know, 6 equals 4 divided by 2. It's the same answer. 6, six is, is 12 over 6 times 3. But when the numerator stays the same and the denominator gets smaller, all right, so see this number here? This is what's changing. Six here, now it's four. Well, if you divide it all by four, you get nine. And if the numerator is one, well, you get even a bigger number. 
And if, you, if the numerator was 0.1, well, that number would be 360. So you see the relationship, the inverse relationship between numbers depending on how they're related to each other. Why am I sharing that? Hang with me. So then we threw this one out, and everyone understood this one, right, when I put this one up. And so Einstein made this famous e equals mc squared, right? And we talked about that these components of this equation represent something pretty profound. And the fact that Einstein said this before any of the scientific equipment was around to support it makes me believe this guy's mind was washed over by the Holy Spirit to understand that E, he said, all energy has a relationship with the mc squared. M was matter or mass. The C is the speed of light. But light is a, is a measurement of distance, which is space and time. So when when you look at this all together, you're saying energy, which is light, has a relationship to matter, space, and time. And that's exactly what happened when God said, let there be light. Boom, his, his word transferred to light, physical light. That physical light transferred to matter, space, and time. And it's been transferring ever since then because God is endless, right? And so the reason I share this, and the reason I share this six equals two times three or whatever, just hang with me, and I won't, I won't make you suffer with this very long. I just want to show you a couple things. The relationships are true, and how bizarre and profound it seems that you could describe all this in an equation. If you rearrange the math, and you take energy divided by the speed of light squared, you end up with mass or matter all by itself. Well, in that 6 equals 3 times 2, if, if this number E, energy, increases, what's going to happen to M? It's going to increase, right? Well, Einstein theorized that there's got to be a relationship with the physical mass and time and space as it all relates to energy. But if the energies of something changes, its mass can change. So why is this important? Well, I want to show you just three little relationships, and then I want to tie it all together. This is a picture of a city, CERN, Switzerland. And this yellow line represents actually the largest single machine ever been built by man. What it is... <coughs> It's an atomic collider, or it's this huge subway, I'll show you another picture, underground of a pipeline with all these little cables and stuff hooked to it. it takes lots of power over, just to run this thing, takes enough energy, you could power 300,000 homes for a year. Um, and all they do with this whole contraption is accelerate little particles to as fast as they can, and they can't get to the speed of light because that's the limit, but they get it pretty close. And you know what happens, and this is a picture inside of this thing, where they eject these little tiny particles. All the, all the stuff they do could fit on the head of a pin. What happens is that this E equals mc squared, when they get the energy increased, the mass increases. And this is 100 years after Einstein was born. Science proved this. Yeah, mass is related to energy, okay, space and time. All right, that's kind of a cool gee whiz thing. So Einstein theories theorized something else. He said space and time, the other part of the equation, can be related to mass, and it can be affected by it. How could that be? So if we rearrange this equation, we have this E over the speed of light is affecting mass. If you redo the math, you say energy over mass can now affect space and time. So what happens here? If you increase the mass of something... Einstein theorized this, and it's actually been proven. He said, you can actually bend time. So there's Time and space are this interwoven fabric. You don't get space without time. And if you really want to bend your mind for a minute, that universe that's expanding, we said, accelerating, it's not accelerating into space. It's not just like, oh, planets are now getting farther apart from each other. It's creating space as it expands. Because you don't get space without mass and time, because they're all coupled together. How that works, does anyone know? So they theorized something of high gravity could bend the fabric of time around it. And so what happened just a few years ago, uh, within a few years, this theory that Einstein said was actually proven. And you know what happened? We have one of these telescopes in outer space, Hubble, and there's this galaxy. And the galaxy has super huge gravity. Behind it, at the right time, and there was a supernova. Supernova means a star blows up. Einstein said the fabric of time and space would bend around 
this high gravity object. And when it does, the photons of light will no longer go in straight lines, they will bend. And what happened? They could see, scientists could see, this little part over here, they could see this single supernova. It's like if I had a light bulb and held it up, but you saw the light bulb in four or more places in the sky because all the light was bending around that galaxy. Now, I know it sounds crazy. They call it gravitational lensing. It proves that space and time are related. Now, I'm going into depth in this more than I need to to show you this last point. What happens if you have the same equation? I promise this is the last one. You have this energy mass relationship. What happens if you're able to take time to zero? If you're able to take time to zero, all of a sudden energy becomes infinite. Well, who's the one who has infinite energy? God, the Almighty, right? When God is present, what does the Scripture say? Alma says, now these guys were thousands of years ago. It says, time is only measured unto men, right? All right, that's Alma 19.38. But Genesis says the earth will rest for the space of a thousand years. It's interesting it uses that word because, because the time part apparently doesn't exist. In section 85, there will be time no longer. So all of a sudden you have the full presence of God, and there can't be time. And so these prophets were saying things well beyond their years that are just now being even proven by science that it's all true. But, but there's a little more to it. So God's word transformed into light, matter, space, and time, and the relationships are mind-boggling. And I, I don't expect anyone to really understand all this. I, I don't claim to. And it's endless. But what is space and time? What is this? And this is really the point of the class. It's our home in this life, right? It's, it, uh, space and time become this place where we live. We don't know existence outside of it. It's a spiritual testing ground. It's, it, we only have a fraction of the power because light is limited by itself. Uh, it becomes really a spiritual prison for us, even though we think there's a prison house. Our, our life is because we are not, we cannot be exposed to the fullness of God's power in this existence. It's not possible, right? We are separate from Him in this space and time. But He didn't want to be separate from us. Now, remember that when it's an equal sign, it's just a gate. You send something through, you get something out. You get light in, you can get matter, space, and time out. It probably works the other way. We don't understand it. So, the Sunday school lesson is the internal and the mortal. In the eternal world, not bound by the limits we have in this life, light can't be limited to 186,000 miles per second if you want to use a constant. But in the mortal, it is limited. And this is the flesh and the biggest point, if you don't take anything else home, is because of this flesh, because of this space and time, we have a will. We have a strong will. And not that we didn't have agency even before we came here, but we don't know the power of the flesh to want to draw us away from God. We don't know that the will of the flesh can be much stronger than the will of the Spirit. That things like murder, lying, deception, all these things come because we're locked in the flesh. And Satan knows how to manipulate the flesh to get us to never want to seek a God for, for answer or for help. So this God, this God came in through that gate, through that gate from eternity into mortality to overcome the will of the flesh so that we could be with him again. You know, people, people like to zero in on sin. And, you know, when it comes down to it, sin is just when you give the, the body, the flesh, the, the flesh power over the spirit. You know, it, it can come by... Um, Things you do or see, it can come by things you eat. You know, addictions, you know, we like to kind of rank these ones, but they're all kind of the same when, whenever, whether it's, it could be a drug or it could be food. You know, it's just the thing that causes you to turn to the fleshly answer instead of the spiritually, spiritual answer. And battles of the spirit can't be won in the flesh. And that's what Jesus was, was trying to teach us. We, and, and Satan wants us to be consumed by things of the flesh, you know, and, and whether it's lust or things we see or how we want to look and all these things, and never consider the things of the Spirit. But it isn't until we consider the things of the Spirit that, that a transformation occurs. Now, to switch gears a little bit. So, why did I share all this stuff about the math? And why did I share all this stuff about the universe? And why did I share all this stuff about E equals MC squared? Because it's all kind of baffling. 
So why did God ask Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac? Did he end up really sacrificing him? Well, no, he kind of got saved by the ram in the thicket. But what was the point of that? Was it to teach us exactly, well, God has this son and he's going to kill him. You're going to almost kill yours, but I want you to learn this lesson from it. It, Something like that. But remember, things done in this world, it's just like the temple vessels. They're symbols to teach us. But the reality of what they're trying to teach us is so much more profound that you know they're giving us a kindergarten level understanding of something that takes graduate PhD to, to start to begin to comprehend. And I'm not talking about in the theology sense, I'm just talking about in a life sense. God gives us everything through the scriptures through a way to learn about something greater, learn in this life about something beyond this life. So he asked Abraham to sacrifice his son so we could relate, just like that's what the six equals two times three was. I mean, I put that up there because you guys can relate to that. None of us, I don't relate to E equals MC squared and what that means. I don't know how you begin with that. But I can relate to a little bit of math and a little bit of algebra. So God does things for us to relate to. But it's, it's more than that. And this is the scriptural lesson for today. Jesus is called the Son of God. So we can relate to, so we can understand, because... Well, let's just read the scripture. God came into through a gate, the same gate we did. It happens through birth. Our spirit joins a body, lives in this world till death, right? Space and time are now our boundaries. The sacrifice for our sin couldn't have occurred in the celestial world. It had to happen in the physical world. Hence, let's just read the scripture. God comes from eternity into our same bondage. Now, why is he called the Son of God? This is where, if you want to turn your, to your uh, Book of Mormons, one of the most profound understandings I think we have of the Son of God is, is in Mosiah 8. Mosiah 8 are the words of Abinadi. And Abinadi was the prophet who came among King Noah's people. King Noah had an unrighteous kingdom, departed from the Nephites, and in that kingdom was also Alma who wrote these words. Abinadi is preaching to the people, and he's telling them about this Savior who's going to come, and he's actually quoting from Isaiah. And as he finishes the quote from Isaiah, he starts in at verse 28, Mosiah 8:28, And Abinadi says, I would that you should understand that God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. That's the very first thing he says. And he gets their attention, and I'm going to tell you why he got their attention in a little bit. But notice what verse 29 says. Because he dwells in the flesh, he will be called the Son of God. Now notice that because he dwells in the flesh. You see, that dwelling in the flesh is the whole point of it the gate and the E equals MC squared and the the light going to mortality because this Spirit of God decides to make a habitation in this world. He's called the Son. He's called the Son because because it denotes the taking on the flesh. And he continues and he says, and having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father... Being the Father and the Son, the Father, because he was conceived by the power of God, and the Son, because of the flesh, thus they are the Father and the Son. And don't turn there, but when, and we, I think we have it in a later slide, but in the end of the Book of Mormon, Ether's story tells the brother of Jared, seeing God's finger, God has been talking in first person God. And then he says, hey, did you see more than this? And Brother Jared says, no, show yourself. And as he reveals himself, he says, behold, this body that you're seeing is the body of my spirit. And as you see the body of my spirit, so will I appear to people in the flesh. That's in the first book of Ether. I think it's 82. And we'll get that here in a little bit. But the point is this. God chose. God chose to take on the same life. And if we think we can understand 6 equals 2 times 3, 
I don't think we can understand E equals MC squared. Well, that's all child's play compared to what this means. The Father's will... Yes, sir? If you go to Genesis chapter 3, it calls him the Son before he's on earth, okay. before he takes the cross. I'll get there. Thanks. Anybody else? So what he says is the flesh was subject to God's will. The power was because of God's will. And they become one God, the eternal Father of heaven and earth. That's what the Book of Mormon says. This passage of Abinadi is actually profound for many reasons. It's why they kill him. In, uh, in the ninth chapter, just a couple pages ahead, at verse 8 and 9, 10, so Mosiah chapter 9, 8, 9, and 10, came to pass, the king caused that his guards should surround Abinadi and take him, and they bound him and cast him into prison. And after three days, having counseled with his priests, caused that he should be brought before them. And he said unto them, Abinadi, we have found an accusation against thee, and you are worthy of death. For you have said that God himself should come down among the children of men, and now for this cause you shall be put to death unless you recall these words which you have spoken. And Abinadi says, I won't recall them. So he stands behind, he stands behind that claim. Now, why is this all important? Why is any of this, the physics, the, the universe, the, all this stuff, it's so we understand the significance of the sacrifice on our behalf, if for nothing else, if for nothing else. Alma calls it an infinite and eternal sacrifice. The great and last sacrifice will be the Son of God, infinite and eternal. Now, Son of, if you use Mosiah 8's definition, means to take on flesh. Son of does not necessarily imply the metaphor or analogy of where a, a father actually takes his son and crucifies him. That was, or, 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 or lays him on the altar to be, to be sacrificed, but the sacrifice was not carried out. We understand the relationship of fathers and sons because that's the world we live in. But God can't relate the celestial to us in our finite minds that we live in, or this finite world that has become ours. So he uses something we can't understand. Now, I want to, and, and to some people this might be, yeah, yeah, I know this. Some people like, might be new. Some people are like, well, that's not what I've heard. And I know there are people actually within our generation who've even divided over, over these words. And, and that's unfortunate. But I want to show you something that's consistent in the scriptures. When we look at these words, to whom are these descriptions ascribed? I'm just going to go through them kind of quick. Father of heaven and earth, Alpha and Omega, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's, these are a lot from the Old Testament. The Lord omnipotent, the Holy One of Israel. That was uh, Isaiah's favorite. I am um, the eternal Father, thy maker, the creator, the God of Israel, the eternal God. God the Father, these are all, I think we would probably agree, are just attributes for God, right? Different names, different things we call them, different things people in Scripture have called them, right? And I'm going to do something here that's a little heavy on Scripture, but I want to I make the point. All these terms that I put up have one or more Scriptures that use them. They aren't just things that we use. Did you know the word Trinity does not actually exist in Scripture? I, I just found that out this morning. I was searching for it. couldn't find it. It doesn't exist. It's something we use to describe a relationship. But nevertheless, the word God, he's my God, your God. Enoch sees this. It's, it's God of heaven. But the Nephites, when Jesus comes, they call him their Lord and their God. And I'm thinking, well, is that right? He was Jesus, right? He wasn't their God, was he? Well, let's continue. So this phrase, eternal God, Deuteronomy says, the eternal God is thy refuge. God the Father, whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not only me, but him that sent me, even the Father. God of heaven and earth. We are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. And there again, Alpha and Omega from Revelation. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And 
The Lord speaks to Moses even using that term. I am the God of God, thy father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And Moses hid his face. He's like, this is God. He was afraid to look. The Lord omnipotent. It's another phrase you get out of Revelation. In the Holy One of Israel, all through, all through the Old Testament, the Holy One of Israel was the God who brought Israel out of Egypt. A couple more. Eternal Father. You know where we use that one? It doesn't occur very often. It's in our communion prayers. Oh God, the Eternal Father. Right? When we address God, we use Eternal Father. Thy Maker. Israel was accused of forgetting their Maker. And it, the maker was even called their husband, all right, in Isaiah 54, 5. And finally, the creator of the ends of the earth. I'll go through these kind of quickly. And a couple more, God of Israel. I am, I am sent you, the burning bush. That was God. But now I want to take these same scriptures, and they're a little bit grayed out. I want to, I want to point this out. The Nephites called Jesus their God. Hmm. The Israelites called him eternal God, but the very title page of the Book of Mormon uses that same term to describe Jesus. He says, this book is written to the convincing of Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. Right? Same term. The Gentiles must be convinced that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, as well as the house of Israel. You see, the Gentiles have this Book of Mormon restored to them right now, but it's not how the prophecy ends. It doesn't end in the kingdom just because the church was restored. The gospel goes back to Israel. This very God who they believe led them by the flaming fire at night and the cloud to cover them by day, the very one who was the I Am who spoke to Moses, the very one who was the Holy One of Israel that Moses prophesied about, they're going to find... That was Jesus. And the Book of Mormon, which 2 Nephi 11, as I shared last week, becomes the standard that converts Israel back. What does it say? Alma says, He shall be brought and arraigned before the bar of Christ the Son, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, which is one eternal God. Alma said this was part of the eternal God's plan to be the infinite and eternal sacrifice. I'm grouping a couple of scriptures here together. When Jesus speaks to the brother of Jared, he says, I am the Father, I am the light, I am the life and truth of the world. The God of heaven and earth. King Benjamin states, He shall be called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth. And, and Alma writes, For we believe in, or I'm sorry, this is more King Benjamin, we believe in Jesus Christ who created heaven and earth. The Alpha and Omega, I'll get you in just a second. The same scripture where he says, I am Alpha and Omega in verse 13. Look at in verse 16. He says, I am Jesus Christ. I'm going to get through these and I'll make a statement and I'll get to you. The same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Nephi writes, Yea, the God of Abraham and Isaac and the God of Jacob yieldeth himself according to the words of an angel as a man into the hands of wicked men to be lifted up. Who got lifted up? They said it was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The same with the Lord Omnipotent. The name of Christ is the Lord Omnipotent. The Holy One of Israel. Nephi says the right way to believe is to believe in Christ, who is the Holy One of Israel. They're all there. Every single writer of the Book of Mormon stated this. It's in some capacity. That he was the creator of all things. That the creator of all things suffers himself to become subject to man in the flesh. The reason I shared all this other is so that we can understand we can't understand. So that we can want to believe that the significance of the sacrifice was something much greater than anything we can understand. You mentioned Genesis 3. So in the inspired version, there is a conversation. And the conversation takes place, who shall go and redeem man? And there's a conversation that says, my beloved who was with me in the beginning was there, and Lucifer was there. 
And this conversation takes place from God in, in the first person. And as it's being described to us, Satan, who become, or Lucifer, who becomes Satan, is given a chance to redeem all mankind. Let me ask you this. If Alma 16 and Alma 19 teach that the only way we could be redeemed was for an infinite and eternal sacrifice to be offered on, on our behalf, could Lucifer have done that? Is it possible to wash away the sin of an eternally infinite penalty by someone who isn't infinite and eternal himself. It's not possible. Yes? I'm leaving out the great gift. You're leaving Which out gift? our agency that we have uh, We have to choose between good and evil. We have to choose Christ to be our Savior. He's the only name. That's been my last class for the last three weeks okay, about our change so of heart. I, I'm trying to think of do you in my opinion you're trying to tell me the Father himself took the cross. I'm not trying to tell you anything. I'm reading scripture from Nephi, oh, Benjamin, and Jesus himself. Do I'm, you feel, is it your belief that the Holy Father is the one that hung on the cross? I do. Because do. the only the only way it becomes an eternal, infinite sacrifice is by what he just said. He just said... There's no other way the penalty could have been paid. So Jesus is an, is an eternal and a God? Jesus, it says, is the Son of God because of what did Mosiah 8 say? I'm saying... The beloved of the Father, which was from the beginning, has always been Christ. Right. He comes down to earth to sacrifice because it says in the Scriptures that he, God created us in our image. Right. Not my image. Let me give someone else a chance. Luke, you had a hand up. Sure. Uh, in Australia, there was a breakaway uh, from, I think it was like 1986 when the church broke away there. Uh, we had to, okay, my parents and the older generation, because I was only young, they had to reestablish the church over there, what they believed, rename it, and, uh, and to establish the church so that they could be right before the Lord of the land. And uh, so in the research uh, with uh, Joseph Smith's vision, uh, we have Joseph Smith's own handwritten account of his vision of how everything was started. And Joseph Smith's own handwritten account says there was a voice, one image, and he called himself Jesus who stood before him. There was no two images in Joseph Smith's own handwritten account. Uh, my father-in-law, he's really good when it comes to uh, all the Hebrewisms and things like that. And he shared that uh, when God spoke to the Jews, uh, he spoke in uh, uh, like riddles, sort of a deal. But when he spoke to the Ephraimites and the, the Manassehites, he spoke to them plainly. Just like the equal sign, this also equals this on either side of the equal sign. And so when he spoke to the Jewish people, uh, it was like, Riddles, but when he spoke to us in the Doctrine of Covenants in the, in the Book of Mormon, he says it straight out like in Doctrine of Covenants section one uh, uh, that he may, might speak in the name of God the Lord, even the Savior of the world. Uh, behold, I am God. And you go to section eight, uh, as the Lord liveth, who is your God and your Redeemer. The Book of Mormon, with all the 15 prophets who spoke about who God was, they all said that Jesus is God, and there is only one God. And so the Book of Mormon started out perfectly, and even in the preface of the Book of Mormon, uh, it says that uh, to Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the living God. Yeah, yeah every... every Every verse, every writer of the, of the Book of Mormon, which was the standard, states this. You know, these, these are just an example. It's not an exhaustive list. But I will point out, you know, First Nephi 3, 183, talks about the Gentiles, the, the people who weren't the Jews. And it says, hey, Jews and Gentiles stumble, but the Gentiles stumbled because of certain plain and precious things that were kept back. And so what happens is that 
God restores truth. God restores truth to try to make it easy. I don't know that it's easy. I want to show you two scriptures real quick before we, we get out of here. Um, all these scriptures that I took of the Bible, uh, of the Old Testament descriptions, are all used in the Book of Mormon to describe the Son. All right? But, and Abinadi was killed, we share this. I, I do want to point something out. You can find this out on your own. Even in our standard from the beginning, there were a few changes, and I'll show you just two of them. In 1 Nephi 3, 62, in the 1908 version, they, now this is true either way. You can read it either way, and it's true if you understand what the Son of God means. But the text reads, The angel said, Behold, the Lamb of God, even the Son of the Eternal Father. Do you know what Joseph Smith's handwritten account said? The angel said unto me, Behold, the Lamb of God, yea, even the Eternal Father. That's in the Restored Covenant Edition. If you've got one, you can compare. Or you can go on Restored Gospel and, and the comparison's there. But even the text was different from one to the next. Here's one more. Be known to all kindreds, tongues, and people that the Lamb of God is the Son of the Eternal Father. That's how it reads in the more modern Book of Mormons. The original says, be it made known to all kindreds, tongues, and people that the Lamb of God is the Eternal Father. That's how, that's how it, was, it was given. There's actually a couple more of those in there, but I won't go through them all right now. When Ether's account is given, it's just like Luke said, the standard says, the body of Jesus was the Spirit of God that came through the gate. And he says, and this is how I will appear to my people in the flesh. Um, and I'm just going to close with this. The people of the world are going to fight about this back and forth. And honestly, you, you have scriptures that go both ways. And whether or not we understand one or understand the other, or we feel passionate about one or passionate about the other, in the end it gets sorted out. In the end, it gets sorted out. But notice that Jesus commanded Nephi to write, hey, in the end, he wants people convinced. And that only convince, that the convincing happens when people are wrought on by the Holy Ghost. When Jesus says, I'm probably way over. Yeah, I am. I know you guys have a service coming up. Um, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm just going to leave these scriptures for you to look up. 2 Nephi 11:78. In Second Nephi, or Matthew 16, 14 through 19, whom do men say that I am? There's a profound implication that I think has been lost in our generation. Um, but this is the one I want to leave you with. No man knows that the Son is the Father and the Father is the Son, but those to whom he will reveal it. That's the revelation of the Holy Ghost. And that's what Jesus said to us. But... Nevertheless, um, I know we're over. I will see you next week. We're going to start in on the covenants, and thank you guys for your attention.